thank you for being here to the start of our uh, new series today, uh, Surviving or Thriving is the title of the series, Surviving or Thriving, Family Life in the Here and Now. What about you and your family? Are you just surviving or are you really thriving as a family? We're going to be having, over the next few weeks, we're going to be considering biblical guidance for family life. Here in the 21st century, it has really changed from what our grandparents would have experienced, even our parents. It's really changed, and there is a desperate need for this series, not necessarily just here at Cornerstone, but I think in all of our churches and in our country. One challenge with a series like this is that those that need it the most are not always present when the very truths that God will use to change the direction of their lives are shared. There are people out there needing answers, needing direction, needing encouragement, and sometimes they just do not look in the right direction. Another challenge is that those that need it most will sit in our congregation, and this gets very direct, and pretend that it, what's being addressed will either not help them or it's not for them. And I mentioned this in Sunday school. How many times have we elbowed our spouse on a particular point? You know? Or thought about, well, what about so-and-so? You know, I wish so-and-so could hear this. But um, the things we're going to be looking at will hopefully be not only an encouragement to you, but a challenge. Or maybe I should say it the other way, not only be a challenge to you, but an encouragement. An encouragement from the standpoint, if you're doing things right, the Lord will let you know. It. If there's some things you've done wrong in the past, if you're still walking and breathing and able to function, you can hopefully bring some uh, change to, to even the past. You see, I love that quote, you know, our scars tell us where we've been. They don't have to dictate where we go. Okay? And, and that is so true. A couple passages we're going to consider as we get into to this series. Uh, I want you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy to begin with. The book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 29. Really, to all the Lord had done for them. 
Israel had not yet really understood these saving events of the past. What events? The events that are recorded in Exodus, the things that occurred throughout the writings of Moses, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Israel's rebellion and disobedience originated from a mindset that could not fully understand the implications of God's saving work. So he gives them a review of the history. In verses 9 through 29, he speaks of the essence of the covenant. Uh, to verses 12 through 14, to confirm them as his people. Verse 15, if the covenant was to be embraced also by future generations. Look at verse 15. He says, But with him that stood, standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. So this, is, this is, would be good for future generations as well. And we see in verses 16 and 18 curses <coughs> for disobedience. He says, beginning in verse 16, for ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which uh, ye passed by. And notice verse 17. And ye have seen the abominations. Now an abomination is something that's detestable to God. You've seen the abominations and their idols, these of the other nations, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Notice verse 18, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. So he talks about these curses for disobedience, but he I want you to highlight there in verse 18, he's talking about lest there should be among you a man, a woman, or a family, or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God. Now, we read in the New Testament that the things that happened to Israel happened for our examples, for our learning. And, you know, he continues in verses 19 through 21 talking about an idolatrous root or behavior and then in verses 22 through 28, the whole nation will be judged uh, when they're swept away in false worship. Right down to verse 28, the loss of the land. It's kind of an overview of the majority of that chapter. But focus in where he says, lest there should be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God. You see, God gives us a standard in His Word. That standard is for life. It's not just for the preacher, for the deacons, for those that serve and attend faithfully in the church. It is for life. If you look at Israel, the various laws they had, they had civil laws, how to govern the nation. They had ceremonial laws with the sacrifices and the various offerings and things. But then they had moral law. We're not Israel. So we are not under necessarily their civil law, although a lot of the laws in this nation were based upon some various things in Scripture. We do not any longer carry out the ceremonial laws. But when it comes to God's moral law, which, uh, which really reflects his moral nature and his character, yeah, we're responsible. And we as individuals, as families, as a church, are responsible not to do what he talks about right here in verse 18. Lest there be among you, and notice he says, man or woman, individual, or family, and in Israel, or tribe, group of families whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God. And what he's addressing here is idolatry. Things, uh, uh, the worship of other gods, the embrace of some of the, the gods of the land and the other nations 
that they've been exposed to or would be exposed to. So this goes on and Deuteronomy closes out and we see the death of Moses. Okay, then go to Joshua chapter 1. Just over a few pages, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 it says now after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun Moses minister saying Moses my servant is dead now therefore arise go over this Jordan thou and all this people into the land which I do give to them even to the children of Israel no, skip down to verse 5, and he says, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. It's God's promise to them. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall, shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee to turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Notice verse 8, the book, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and <clears throat> then thou shalt have good success. Okay? So as you study through Joshua, Joshua leads the people into the promised land. They conquer other nations. They take possession of the land. Now turn to Joshua. I believe it's chapter 24. Joshua 24. This is nearing the life of Joshua coming to an end. He's nearing the close of his life. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's meeting with Israel. And we see these words. Now therefore, verse 14, Joshua 24. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. That's how God wants us to serve him, in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua made that clear where he would be at, where his household would be. We will serve the Lord. He says, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. You know, I looked inside of my wedding band as I was preparing for this message, and Tammy had engraved in here, I love you, and she put Joshua 24, 15. That was an important verse to us. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And you know, if we're not careful, we may think serving the Lord is something completely different than what it is. And we can miss some important aspects of how we need to live. Now, as we go through this series, we're not just talking to families. We are talking to individuals. And we're talking to our church family as well, because a good bit of what we're going to look at can apply in many different areas. So today, I want to talk to you and give you really seven things to consider in regards to the desperate need for this series. Now, just to jump ahead just a little bit, 
Next week, try your best not to miss it. We're going to talk about right beginnings. Next week is so important to the rest of the series. So if you can be here, please, please do. When we talk about surviving or thriving, the desperate need for this series, the family, many families in America <coughs> are surviving, but they're not thriving. First of all, and we'll talk more about this later, I want to make it clear to you, a family is not a husband, wife, and children. When you set, make your marriage vows to one another before God in the presence of those that are assembled, and God uh, unites you as husband and wife, that is the beginning of your family. Sometimes people think, well, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say this, well, when are you going to, when are you going to start your family, meaning when are you going to have children? Well, children are a welcomed addition to our family. But when you come together as husband and wife, you form a family unit, okay? So when we consider this series, when we talk about the desperate need for this series, we can't not address some of the things I'm going to talk about today. And for some, these things may be difficult to hear, okay? Sometimes when we look at things that might hit close to home, it's difficult, it's hard. But we have to realize where we're at, our nation is at, and like I said, if, if these things don't apply to you, then praise the Lord, you're doing what God would want you to do, okay? First thing, broken family. Broken family, you don't have to look very far to find a broken family. One of the illustrations that I think is so impactful is if you take a blue piece of construction paper and a pink piece of construction paper and glue them together and let them set up. And say that those pieces are um, shaped in the shape of a heart. The blue represents the man, the pink represents the woman. And later come along and pull that apart. They've been united, okay? Scripture says that a husband is to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So they've been united. But when you pull that leaving and cleaving apart because of broken homes and divorce, you'll notice you leave a part of the color of that construction paper on each side. In other words, you leave a part of yourself with those that you used to be united with. Okay? Divorce can be so devastating. And because of that, we have to include it in the desperate need for a series like this. A Gallup poll listed among the issues with the highest increase in acceptance in the last 14 years as divorce. That was one of the things listed with the highest increase in acceptance in the last 14 <coughs> years. 71% accepted it. Previously, it was 59%. That's up 12%. We're not talking about those that are divorced. We're talking about the, the mentality of just the acceptance of it. In Scripture, um, if you would look at with me in Malachi chapter 2, and verse 16. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. I know from a biblical standpoint you can have godly Bible teachers that are very knowledgeable in the scriptures be on different perspectives, different ends about the divorce and remarriage issue. And we're not even going to talk about that part right now. Okay? Because that is one of these areas where good Bible teachers could have different viewpoints. 
uh, on the divorce and remarriage issue. But I want you to notice in Malachi 2, verse 16, the first part of that verse, it says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Putting away is divorce. Regardless of what side we're on in regards to uh, the acceptable divorce and remarriage, regardless of where you're at with that, God hates it when a, a family is broken. And if the husband and wife create the family unit, the family is broken. When the unity of the marriage bond is torn apart, you leave a part of yourself with that person, whether you want to or not. The structure of the home is fractured, and the stability of that home is lost. As hard as it is to hear that and think about it, that's what happens. Also, secondly, there's confusion today about the makeup of a family. This is not something when I was growing up I ever thought we would have to be looking at and considering. A Pew Research Center poll or survey said about 6 in 10 adults, which is 61%, express a positive view of the impact of same-sex marriage being legal including 36% who say it is very good in society. There's a lot of confusion out there as far as the makeup of a family. And some of our churches aren't helping that confusion. Another statistic from Research Center, 60% say a person's gender is determined by their sex assigned at birth. This is up from 56% in 2021 and 54% in 2017. So that's, that's a good thing. 60% say a person's gender is determined by the sex assigned at birth. The public is divided over the extent to which our society has accepted people uh, who are transgender. 38% say society has gone too far in accepting them, while a roughly equal share, 36%, say society hadn't gone far, far enough. About one in four say things have been about right there. Gallup says, Again, listed among the issues with the highest increase in acceptance in the last 14 years, gay or lesbian relationships, 40% up to 63%. It's high, a 23% increase. The more you work to make something seem normal or right, the more we will find public acceptance. Okay. A lot of times what triggers concern in the public is when you move too fast. You move slow and very calculated. You can get a lot of different agendas. And a lot of people just don't pay attention to things that's going on. And really it seems, when we were talking about this some in Sunday school, it, it seems negative on Christians from the cultural standpoint who take a stand against transgender or homosexual or lesbian or LGBTQ, whatever you want to add to that. It makes us look bigoted and society wants to paint it as such. You see, as we consider applying truth to this whole series in regards to the family, we have to say, what is truth? Where is God at on this? Okay? You know, the decisions that elevated and escalated this confusion uh, have happened over a period of time. You see, for millennia, uh, civilization has been defined as marriage, exclusive union of a man and a woman. 
two decades ago, politicians in our country voted across party lines to define this definition of marriage in what is called the Defense of Marriage Act. It's a good thing. Then along comes June 2013. Supreme Court of the United States struck down the key provisions of that act, paving the way for the complete redefinition of marriage across the American culture. In their majority, I'm sorry, their minority opinions, uh, Justices John Roberts and Anton Scalia uh, both acknowledged how the majority court had was paying supporters of marriage as it has been defined for millennial as bigots <coughs> who sought to demean, disparage, humiliate, and injure same-sex couples. And folks, if you take a stand on biblical truth, that is exactly how you are painted. That hasn't changed. Then along comes June 26, 2015. Supreme Court in a 5-4 to four decision legalized gay marriage across all 50 states and the White House celebrated being uh, lit up in rainbow colors for gay marriage. Sad day in America. These decisions and the repercussions from them have literally contributed to families been being thrown into turmoil. There's probably people in here more than I realize that families have been touched by some of this turmoil. And if you haven't been touched by it, you may in the future. You see, when an adult child, no longer a child, but a child to you, chooses to embrace a same-sex relationship or gender change, how do you refer to them? By the birth name <coughs> or by the chosen name? by their birth gender or their chosen gender. What about other siblings? What do you tell them? What about holidays and celebrating the holidays together? How about special events in the lives of, their, of family members now? How about children that are brought into a homosexual union? And here's a really discerning, a dis concerning one. Now the education system is getting involved in regards to a child's gender. That is scary. That is so scary. It seems like America in many ways is like the old, I think it was ACDC song, Highway to Hell. Because things are getting pretty tough. And the attack is on Christians, the church, and the family. Okay? We have God's viewpoint, though. Just as God hates divorce, where he's at is even clearer when it comes to uh, homosexual, lesbian, transgender things. You see, the book of Genesis, let's, let's go there, book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. The book of Genesis gives us God's original intent for man and his partner. Genesis chapter 2. What I want you to note here is God made them male and female. It says in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. <coughs> but for Adam there was not found a helpmate for him. Now, that may seem strange if you're reading through it, because if you look at verse 18, it talks about God saying, I'll make a helpmate for Adam. And then in verse 20, it's, 
I'm sorry, in verse 21, it talks about, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. First wedding. The creator of the universe brings the first man his bride. But what I want you to notice is in between talking about the creation of Eve and man, it's not good for man to be alone, and then the actual description of the creation of Eve, he kind of, it almost looks like gets off on a rabbit trail. He starts talking about animals and Adam ain't naming the animals. But there is a purpose in that. And that purpose is the latter part of verse 20. But for Adam there was not found an help me for him. There was none like Adam. <clears throat> so God creates the woman. It says in verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, in view of what we've just read, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, we could actually say be glued to, his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's where it began. God made them male and female. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, it says, He answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? People might say, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender kind of did right here, where he says, he says clearly, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. Also notice back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, they were made distinct, unique, different to complement one another, including sexually. Okay? Genesis 1.28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Be fruitful, and multiply. Why? Because they're distinct from one another. Unique, distinct, different, to complement one another. Third thing I want you to see in that same verse. God told the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply. I just mentioned that. I'm getting ahead of myself. You see, sex is a sacred expression within the confines of marriage between a man and his wife. All sexual expression outside of the bond of marriage is immoral and sin, and it's prohibited in Scripture. Again, what we think about divorce, what we think about transgender, homosexual, lesbian activity has to be informed by Scripture. It is not open for our own opinions if we're going to be a Christ follower. Okay? With all that said, therefore, homosexual is not born that way. Amen. Contrary to public opinion, they are not born that way. The thinking and behavior is <clears throat> learned, developed, or chosen. Okay? Why can you say that so boldly, preacher? Scripture does not teach, okay? Scripture does not teach that people are guilty for having been tempted with same-sex attraction. There are many heterosexuals that are tempted with 
relationship attractions that they should not get into. Okay? <coughs> Heterosexuals get tempted uh, by people that are not their spouse. Okay? We all face temptations of various kinds. Why? We've been infected by what? Sin. Sin. Biblically speaking, homosexuality is not something you are, meaning your identity. Okay, that's what we've got to get across to people. It's not your identity. Homosexuality is something you do. You understand? If I go out today and I have, I cheat on my wife, what is that? That's adultery, right? Adultery is not my identity. Adultery is what I do. I'm an adulterer because of what I do, right? So God made it clear in his word what a family is. We see in Genesis 1.31 that as God looked out over all of his creation, he was well pleased. The creation account makes it perfectly clear that heterosexuality is God's design for mankind. If you think of Genesis 1 and 2 this way, Genesis 1 gives us the full creation account. Genesis 2 kind of narrows in and focuses in on day 6 of creation. So that's why you can see God talking about the man and woman being fruitful and multiplying in chapter 1. When Eve hadn't even been created, it looks like if you're just reading it um, straight through till chapter 2. But chapter 2 is just focusing in on day six that took place and is recorded in chapter one. God was pleased with his creation. We are told in scripture, get this, this is so important, we are fearfully, wonderfully made. Okay? We are fearfully, wonderfully made. Scripture says in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That passage in Psalm 139 is really part of verses 13 through 16, which describes God's creation of the individual inside the mother's womb. How he weaves that individual together. How he knows that person prior to birth. Tremendous passage to read. Repeatedly, in Scripture, homosexuality is condemned. Okay? This is where I am astonished at how a church can ever say it's okay. Now, would we allow a homosexual to come to Cornerstone? Yes, we would. We would allow them to come right in here and sit right where you're sitting. Hope you'd make room when you appear. We don't treat those people like they have lepers. Could they become a part of this church? No. That's why membership is important. For the simple reason you become a part of this local church family through membership. Why could not a homosexual become a part of this church? Because we believe, and Scripture teaches, it's not because of what we believe, because really, you know what? It doesn't matter what we believe. What matters is what Scripture says. It's clear in Scripture that anyone that continues in that lifestyle, it could be evidence of a lost condition. Let's move on. We've, we've talked about two of, of, of these things out of the seven. Let's go to the third. Cohabitation is a normal lifestyle. It talks about sexual relations and living together outside of marriage. Pew Research again. Adults between the age of 18 to 44. 59% have lived with an unmarried partner at some point in their lives, while 50% have never been married. 8 in 10 adults younger than 30, which is 78%, say that cohabitation is acceptable even if the couple does not plan to marry. Again, we go back to our list by Gallup. It talks about over the last 14 years, 
uh, issues with the highest increase. Sex between an unmarried man and a woman went 68% now accepted. Previously it was 53, that's up 15%. Preacher, why are you talking about this one? Because it's important. You see, the institution of marriage represents the, the very foundation of social order. One of the best defenses for this cherished and vital institution is to model healthy marriages and families for the whole world to see. That's why we need to see to model healthy marriages. There are some marriages out there that somebody that's not married would look at and say, I'd be afraid to get into something like that. It's going to be complicated to get out. But people need to see what is a godly Christian God's viewpoint is so clear. Sexual relations. Make sure you note this. Sexual relations outside of marriage is sin. It's repeatedly condemned in Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Fornication, pornea, sexual immorality. Sexual relations outside of the marriage bond. It goes on. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Flee fornication. Flee it. For every sin that a man does is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. Pretty strong language, isn't it? Nevertheless, he says, to avoid fornication, sexual sin, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. That word whoremongers? Meaning fornicators. It's saying God will judge. It is completely contrary to who you profess to be as a Christian to get involved in sexual relations outside of marriage. And for those that do the habitual practice, I want you to look at something with me. 1 Corinthians 6.9. 1 Corinthians 6.9. says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see that? Who will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous. Be not deceived, neither what? Fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers with themselves with mankind. He's not talking about someone that commits this act in a moment of temptation, gives into the flesh, confesses it, gets it right, he's talking about an habitual offender. That's the habitual practice of that sin is evidence of a lost condition. And that is so sad. Not a popular message today but a need that we need this series so, so much because of the things I'm covering with you are so accepted out in the world today, our culture today, friends, family members, and some churches. Fourth, absentee fathers. Absentee fathers. On Father's Day, man, we're going to be talking about is there a man in the house? That goes along with the series. You see, 
For decades, the share of U.S. children living with a single parent has been rising, accompanied by a decline in marriage rates and a rise in births outside of marriage. According to Pew Research Center, study of 130 countries and territories show that the U.S., the United States, has the world's highest rate of children living in single-parent households, 23%. Don't get me wrong. I respect those women for keeping their kids, making the best of a tough, tough situation. We have a problem with absentee fathers. Again, listed among the highest increase in acceptance in the last 14 years, having a baby outside of marriage, up 16% from 45 to 61. U.S. Census Bureau, out of about 11 million single family, parent families with children under the age of 18, nearly 80% were headed by single mothers. Guys need to step up. They really do. There are three levels of relationship a father can have with his children. Let me give them to you. One, first level, biological. They're the daddy. Biological. Second one, provider protector. In other words, they want to make sure the child is cared for and protected. The third level is relational commitment. Relational commitment, one of mutual trust and loyalty between the two. Relational commitment, one of mutual trust and loyalty between the two, the child and the parent. You see, we get into this dilemma of is this a quality time or quantity time relationship? Let me give you a third consideration. How about whatever, whether it's quality or quantity, you focus on the relational commitment between the child and the parents. That is a win-win. You see, many fathers today are absent from the home. Kids grow up and don't even know their dad. At home, many dads are at home, but get this, disconnected in the lives of their children, wrapped up in doing their own thing. They're present, but they might as well not be because a lot of everything falls on the mom. Studies have found that children raised without a father are at a higher risk of having behavioral problems, four times more likely to live in poverty, more likely to be incarcerated in their lifetime, twice as likely to never graduate high school, at seven times higher risk of teen pregnancy, more vulnerable to abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, and twice as likely to be obese. Not a very good picture. Dads, you guys are important. <clears throat> Not to minimize the mom, but in many of these cases, the mom is shining forth, and the dad's just being a dud. Please don't ever be a dud. Not only absentee dads, people living together, family not being able to be defined, the confusion surrounding that, divorce, but fifth is substance abuse in the home. More than a third of Americans say alcohol has caused trouble in the family. More than a fourth report family troubles because of drug abuse. Altogether, 46% according to Gallup have experienced one or the other issues. Sadly, in the home is where the child is first, in many cases, exposed to alcohol. First time I ever drank alcohol was <coughs> sipping a beer with my dad. First time. 
I had a friend whose mother kept her bottle of gin up in the cabin in the house, and he very well knew where it was at. It's sad. Substance in the home. Sixth, and I'm trying to hurry. This is in a question. Who or what is influencing your children? Or your grandchildren? Who or what? Is television? <coughs> Video games have become extremely popular. Minecraft, Fortnite, those type of things. Extremely popular. Social media, music, peers, teachers and coaches. Ask yourself this question as a parent or grandparent. Who or what has your child or grandchild's heart? Who has it? You see, not that all of these things are wrong in and of themselves, but there can be a lot of things influencing Remember the, I've shared this year before, remember this show, um, I think it was Full House. Is that the show with the little twin, twin girls that play? You know, our girls watched that song growing up. We would see, you want to say, you're going to preach against Full House of all things? I'm just giving an illustration. We would see behaviors in our girls growing up. Like, where did that come from? Cut the TV on. Happened to be sitting there watching that show. There it is. There's the behavior. That's where it came from. Just ask yourself, from going on the day, who or what is influencing your children? And lastly, this is number seven, but possibly one of the very most, probably the most important in, in everything I said. So. If you've tuned me out until now, tune back in. Okay. The missing reality of Christ. The missing reality of Christ. Note, I am not saying that you don't have your kids in church or that the family is not in church. I'm talking about the missing reality of Christ in the home. And I've used these quotes before, but bear with me, they're so, so impactful. The greatest struggle, I'm sorry, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today, according to this quote, is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Charles Spurgeon said, nothing corrupts children more than to see a parent who has a form of religion but lacks reality with God. As soon as your children, I'm sorry, the first part of that quote was not Spurgeon, the second part is, as soon as your children can understand anything, Spurgeon says, let them know about Christ. As soon as they can understand anything, let them know about Christ. In many cases, what we see in families' public life at the store, outside, at the lake, at church, at social events, in many cases what we see in a family's public life is different from the reality that exists in their private life. Who am I talking? Talking to you. This is hard to bring, but it can be true. And if you have a consistency between your public life and your private life, praise the Lord for it. I've shared this before. A personal goal in my life is I purpose to live in such a way that those that know me best respect me most. I think that's a worthy goal for all of us. Those that know us best. Who knows us best? Your wife, your husband, your children. Right? That they be the ones that respect you the most. You might say, well, that's already messed up. I fouled up years ago with that. Well, during this series, we're going to be talking about how to fix that. Because I want to encourage you, there is hope. 
You see, the pattern in our individual lives, in our families, in our churches, the pattern of dysfunction must stop. The cycle must end, so why not allow it to end with you? You ever go along in life and you see things about yourself and the way you react to things and think of your mom or dad? Hey, they used to act like that. I didn't like it. But they used to act, and now I'm doing it. Well, if it's good qualities, that's great. But if they were dysfunctional in an area, even if it was just for a period of time in their life and then they changed it, but you, you're struggling with it, the dysfunction, the cycle, must end. Pastor Charles Stanley, who just went to be with the Lord, states, Serving God faithfully doesn't happen by chance. It is deliberate choice. We make with every decision and action of our lives. He goes on to say, teaching our family to follow God doesn't occur by happenstance. Either we, make, we must consciously model the life of faith to those we love, taking every opportunity to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Let's bow our heads.